This is a misleading management approach that a lot of people have, and even I was at fault. And when he told us that, we were like, whoa, we're already maxed out. We have too many animals, basically. And our other challenge is Dunbar and Big Joe, if you don't already know, they can't be together. So we're looking at cutting this herd in half, basically. I got some decisions to make, so me and Marissa will talk about it and see what we want to do. Hey guys, Dusty Baker of Cross Timbers Bison. Welcome back to the channel. So with mine and uh, Marissa's mission, when we got the Ponderosa in October of 21, we had all of our animals at Mom and Kevin's, the Lynch Place, the OG. And I'm not sure, I don't remember how many we had at that time. Maybe, I don't know, 15 or so. And, uh, you know, that was a place we were so fortunate to have um, where we started our herd at Mom and Kevin's place. Them letting us, um, you know, get their property basically <laughs> programmed around bison and built around bison. And so when we got the Ponderosa, we got 189 acres. And that doesn't mean it's all grazable 189 acres you've got creeks you've got trees you've got barns you got ponds you've got all those things you've got blackberry bushes where you can't graze and so not exactly 189 acres of grazable land but you know the whole idea is we had more land so which means you can expand and have more bison and that's what we want to do that's you know and then when we got over here we got involved with people like cole fagan and uh and Ethan McJames, Cole Fagan's part of the Oaks and Prairies Venture um, based out of Ada, Oklahoma. Then you've got Ethan McJames who works for the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, which is the NRCS. Both local guys, and so that's where the burn came in in October of 22. And um, those guys can give you a technique approach and management approaches to you know, being a part of regenerative ag and being holistic and managing your land the proper way instead of just throwing a bunch of animals out here and let them go, right? They're trying to teach us and help farmers and ranchers, not just us, that's their job, is to help farmers and ranchers try to manage their land properly, which benefits the soil, which benefits um, your water, basically, and then also can, like what we do with Cole Fagan, is benefits the wildlife. And so you, it's a holistic approach. It's the bugs. It's the, it's the birds. It's not just about bison. So we started diving into that um, really when we had the burn, the prescribed burn in 22. And um, now that we've been smacked with, you know, three hard summers of this drought, we're kind of having to take a step back with how many animals we have over here. Um, and, and besides our, 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 our herd size, the two herds, bringing Dunbar over, we wanted him to be in the same place of all of our animals. And, um, you know, there's still animals at Mom and Kevin's. We didn't take them all over here, but we have too many animals, basically. And our other challenge is Dunbar and Big Joe, if you don't already know, they can't be together. They're two mature bulls. And because they didn't grow up together and they're both relatively the same age that they're going to compete and this summer I, we had some stuff happen where Dunbar tore two gates down to get to Big Joe that was a mistake on his part because Big Joe set him in his place Big Joe's a year older he's a little bit heavier than Dunbar they got into it Dunbar gets injured could have been way worse that was in the middle of breeding season so and the way our land is designed it's kind of an L shape, or a backward Z, really. Um, it's uh, it's very hard to do pasture rotations. It's um, difficult on that part moving the bison because if there's not a pasture between the two bulls, they're gonna fight. And like on a fence like this, this is just a cross fence. They would tear it down, and they did that this summer. We had to patch up fence because they got into it. They tore the fence down. So you've got to have a pasture between each other or a lane which means more fencing so that they can't touch nose to nose basically they can huff and puff at each other on opposite sides but you have to have a space between them the way our land is designed it makes it difficult now we love big joe and we love dunbar we love having them here but it's very difficult so there's that side of it our management side of of just the animals themselves and then you have the um regenerative side of it you know, bringing back native grass and, and eradicating some of these 
um, invasive species of woody encroachment, cedar and blackberry bushes, all of those things, you know, have a holistic approach to it. And so we've had to kind of set back and look at things a bit different. We've been looking for land to lease. We've been looking for land to possibly purchase. And in a place like this, Murray County, there's not a lot of availability of land. And, um, you know, if you do try to lease a property, you get into the fence side of it. Okay, well, how much fence do we have to build? Because it is bison. You don't have to put up these massive exotic fences, but you do have to have a decent, you know, uh, measurable fence. And so that's not easy to find the right land to do that with. Uh, because we've talked about splitting the herds up and having only one herd here to manage, which saves the land, helps the soil, helps the water, and then also helps us as a animal husbandry and managing those animals the right way. So we're looking at cutting this herd in half, basically, or having one herd here and moving the other herd. And then you don't want to move them very far. You want to keep them relatively close so they're easier to manage for us so we don't have to travel far. So those are the whole things that we're looking at, um, which brings me to my next point. We're going to go see Ethan McJames up at the NRCS, and we're going to go over stocking rate with you guys. This is a misleading um, management approach that a lot of people have, and even I was at fault. You know, you grew up around here, and it's like you can have four or five acres per head. That's not true. And the first time Ethan came out, he ran some numbers in his head and on his phone, and he said, just by being out here, he said, you're looking at having... 11 acres per head and when he told us that we were like whoa we're already maxed out so we're going to go up there and we're going to work on uh he's got a management tool on showing us how to get a proper stocking rate for the ponderosa specifically and there's a couple of different ways you can do that and we're going to show you one of those techniques today see you guys in a second We're up here at the Murray Cat Extension Office with one of our became a good friends now. Over time, um, met Ethan McJames a couple years ago when we did our prescribed burn together at the Ponderosa. But um, been very technical and very helpful on the holistic approach of regenerative um, ranching and stuff, human colfagan. But we're up here, and um, Ethan is going to talk to us about stopping rates and some other stuff that um, he can explain way better than me. And so things that can help us, Marissa and I, um, on our side of managing our uh, ranch, but um, something that may be helpful to um, producers out there, farmers and ranchers or landowners out there that can help you um, manage your land as well. So we're gonna dive into this real quick and we're gonna show you some resources that um, your local extension office, the NRCS, which is what Ethan is a part of. Um, I'll kind of let him introduce himself to as well, but we're gonna, we're gonna learn some stuff. Yeah, so a variety of partners can provide these services, but certainly NRCS is a great resource. Um, we do forage inventories. We determine how much forage you have, which ultimately affects your stocking rate so that you're not overstocked, so you don't overutilize your range land or your pasture land. There's traditional way, and I have a little guide over here. All right, so traditional way would be to clip and weigh the forage. I've got a guide here that explains how to do that. Um, you may do that either in your pasture, right. but if there's animals grazing, another option is to put up a grazing exclosure, like a fenced off area right yes. here. And you'll see, I like a four by four, four foot by four foot panel. That gives you enough room to get this in here to do the estimate. And then it also keeps the animals out of here. So this is a hoop. It's nice. Um, 
it's small. You can toss it randomly. You can, you know, make it small if you need to. Everything I have fits in that little clipboard right there. Okay. Another handy deal is this grazing stick. So you can use this also, and you can make a three by three plot. So you would clip all that forage. It would ideally be at the end of the growing season. It would be dry. If you clipped it now, you would want to dry that forage out because we're estimating air dry forage for our stocking rate. So you could clip it, leave it in a bag and let it dry and then weigh it. That way we're not overestimating, but you can do a three by three. For example, if you clip this three by three, you would multiply grams of the forage in this clipped plot by 10.7, and that would give you pounds per acre. So this is how we traditionally do it. We still do it this way. It's great. I still recommend everybody have a grazing exposure. It gives you an idea. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just clip that exposure every year. If we're so what he's basically saying is literally going out, having your your measurement, whatever it's a four by four or three by three, going out there and actually clipping the grass, the fuel, like your native grass, and then weighing, letting, it. weighing it, letting it dry, like basically become hay, mm -hmm. sort of, exactly. and then drying the weight of, or, you know, getting the weight of that fuel or that food, Yep, your forage. Just like knowing how many bales an acre you produced of hay, that yes. tells you how much you produce. Right. Okay. So you can, cool. you can stick it in a Walmart bag and weigh it. You can weigh it by species by putting rubber bands around it. This is a 300 gram scale. This kind of gets the job done. So you could do it in an exposure or like on a bigger ranch, we might do it by individual ecological site. For example, that Eastern gamma, gamma grass patch that you have, yeah. that is arguably the most productive grass that we have, period. Yep. Um, so that area is gonna produce 4,000 to 6,000 pounds to the acre, whereas other areas may produce less based nice. on soil type, uh, the depth of the soil, um, this, the plants that are there. So we may go Drought. on, exactly. Drought. So we may go on our ranch and we might do three random hoops. Ideally, we do 10 to 20. Uh, hoops and then we okay. average those together. We can clip by species, uh, weigh individual species and get the species composition. It's 40% Eastern Gamma Grass and 20% Big Blue Stem. So this is, this is still a great way to do it. At the very least, the grazing exposure is incredibly easy to do and I highly recommend that everybody do that as well. But now we have this tool called the Rangeland Analysis Platform. And this is really cool. So we've had, we have satellites that circle the earth every 16 days and get a full picture of the earth. We have- Some people I know like that. <laughs> yeah, they're fast, they're fast too. So that's been happening since I think 83 roughly. So about 40 years of data. The thing that's interesting about data is you collect it, not knowing what you're gonna do with it in the future. You just need to collect it, right? Because now we have this data since 1983 well then also the Bureau of Land Management, typically out in the West, and then NRCS all over the United States once a year do a thing called the National Resource Inventory. So we go out to random places in every county all over the United States and we do some clipping and weighing and species composition and we get some actual boots on the ground data. And that data is stored. So now we have 40 years of satellite data and then this ground truth data, and now we have the power of all these algorithms. And so the satellite data, now we can take the satellite data and we're looking at reflectance and we're looking at um, normalized uh, vegetation indexes and we can look at reflectivity and determine annuals versus perennials and shrubs versus grasses. Mm -hmm. So now that we have the power of the computer and all that old data, now the computer can go back to the old data from it's 1983 and it's thinking, it's yeah. thinking, it's going, oh, now I get it. Now I understand how to determine from that old data, which is a shrub, which is a tree. We can look at woody encroachment. Mm -hmm. We can look at cheatgrass after a wildfire out west. Um, that usually comes in afterwards. So we yeah. can look at a lot of things. There's a lot of power here. The cool thing about this is it's super handy way to get a quick stocking rate for producers. So that's actually, right here and i can move the screen so we can look at it um, you go to this rangeland analysis platform we call it the wrap and right here this so there's several things you can do here um, we'll look at this partner tool at the end it's pretty neat but you just go to this production explorer and hit launch production explorer and stocking rates a moving target right it's yeah. 
you know, it's it can be site specific. It's going to change from year to year. Lots of variables. But this thing gets you really close, you know, mm -hmm. so you're not guessing. And then you can make your adjustments, and you should be flexing just like you know nature does and wildlife does. We do the same thing with our animals. Uh, flex with the, for example, last year we had 60% of normal rainfall during the growing season. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, we produce 60% of our normal warm season grasses. Yeah, grasses yeah. So you can't stock it full stocking rate at that time, or you've got to come up with some other contingency uh, measures like additional uh, haying or mm -hmm. some other things. So um, you can either import your land units, that's upload a shape file. That would be like from a mapping software, I could mm -hmm. send you a shape file. Which is this right here. The, yes, like this. your ranch. Yep, so, so I could send you a shape file of that if yeah. you wanted. And, and, and any NRCS office could provide that and service. I have this already because you sent it to me, but here's just a quick paper version of it. Um, the layout of the lane. Yep. Okay. Yep. Or you could draw your feature. So this is what most people will do. Um, say you want to buy a new ranch in Montana and you yeah. want to figure out stocking rate. Boom. You can look at this tool. So, you know, you, it's, it's got a lot of power and, and it's, there's a lot of information for the Western United States, but certainly, um, you can theoretically pull data for anywhere in the United States. So you could find your land or find somebody else's and draw. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A perspective property that you want to buy, something like that. So we're going to go find your place right here. So you have map and satellite. So satellite's satellite. going to be slower. So now we'll hit satellite now that we're zoomed in. It's easier to tell off the satellite for sure. Yep. Um, so if we draw the perimeter of your property, it's going to average everything together. For example, it's going to average the potential 6,000 pounds per acre of eastern gamma grass production with the maybe 2,500 pounds per acre of side oats grama production on okay. another site. You can do it field by field, and I have done that before on a bigger ranch here in Murray County. I do each individual field. I actually uploaded the shape files, but I get the stocking rate for each individual field uh, and or the pounds wow. per acre for each individual field. Wow. So let's see here. You're out there. That's yours? Uh -huh. Okay. So we'll zoom in there. Is that your barn right there? No, no that's it. Yeah, this is the front. Okay, uh, so I'll let you, I'll let you draw it off. You can draw a polygon or a rectangle. I recommend drawing a polygon. Um, and actually, we'll we'll scroll in a little bit more here. Just on all of it, or just or just a pasture. Um, you can do it by pasture, maybe for today, since it's easier okay. and quicker. Um, but yeah, you, if you want that okay. that variability that exists, we can do the front. You want or to do, do just one pasture? Or it doesn't matter. Okay, well, I'll What's click draw a polygon and you go ahead and draw it in. Okay, so I'm going to... Yep, just click. And then hold it. And then, and then uh, see that? There you go. So we're going to go here, down to here, here. This is where it gets weird. Yeah. So, it, you know, it goes here, but then... And we can adjust as long as you know your total acres for the stocking rate deal, so you just have to get it close today. Um, how do I go back this way? Okay, look, delete last point if you want to do that. And I need to scoot over. I think you can just click and drag. Uh, and then if you have to, you can delete last point. See, you made a point, just hit delete last point. Okay, so we're going to go down here. This is halfway nine acres. There's Ed McNeil's place. I'm not an expert. I'm still becoming familiar with the tool myself, but. And then, go down. There's the hay meta. There's our little lane. Well, let's fix that one. It's a little off. Might have to, yeah, there you go, beautiful. And then click okay. on your last, click first point to close this shape. Okay. And then we'll, now here we can set analysis period. So remember, we have data going back to, I think we can go all the way back to 1983. This is stopping at 1986. Still a lot of data, but let's do a five-year average. So go to 2017. So scoot this. Uh, yep. 
And we can look at this year's production. So it's stopping at 2022. There's uh -huh. another tab up here, current year production. We could look kind of like, hey, are we on track? Are we below normal up to this point in the year? So there's some other tools up here we can look at, but we're gonna do the quick stocking rate calculator. So okay. hit calculate time series. So we're gonna look at a five year average from 2017 to 2022 for that polygon, which is your place. Yes. So this is burn unit. This is our 70 acre burn unit here. <clears throat> this is the front, which is where our barn is. This is the nine acres. We cleaned out a pond there. This is the hay meadow where Dunbar currently is in the hoss herd. Um, but this was the burn unit right, right here. So where we burn about 70 acres, I guess. Okay. So go ahead and hit close right there. Okay, so is 192 right or is it what it's, it's it's technically 189. So hit down the down button. You can increase or decrease. So just it left the point too. So we got one 189. Okay. And then how how much did the on average how much did they weigh? Thousand. Thousand pounds. Okay. And then let's, let's just say since we drew the whole unit off that the number of days they'll be grazing this land unit is 365. Okay, and then this is standard. 3% of body weight for a 1,000 pound animal unit is 30 pounds per day. So when you want to figure out how much hay you need, 30 pounds per day. That's air dry. If they were 1,200 pounders, they'd be 36 pounds per day. Okay. You know, and then there's some other cool spreadsheets out there. Pasture map, Maya grazing. You can really go deep into this. Maya grazing, for example, looks at a lactating cow's nutritional requirements versus um, a weaned calf. Mm -hmm. And then you enter all that data and it really gets in deep. Um, so this is just a rough, but it gets you super close. Um, but, but those other apps are really interesting. Um, pasture map, I have a subscription to pasture map and, and I, or a producer gave me his, um, his uh, ID and password oh, gotcha. and to, use it? To, to play with it and, and cool. check it out. Um, so um, harvest efficiency, 25% harvest efficiency. What, so what that is, so we always take half and we leave half of the plant, right? And then of the half that we take, they waste about half of that. They drop it, they stomp on it, yeah. urinate on it, defecate on it. So, so if we produced 1,000 pounds per acre, there's really only 250 pounds per acre that are available to the animal. Take half, leave half, but then you get half of the half. So that's what 25% harvest efficiency is. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. And so, and then all of this is kind of talking about soil health and how we want to protect our herd above and below ground. And this is old data that's been repeated over and over again. This, this is uh, for different species, but you can see that when we, when we graze 90% of the plant, 100% of the roots stop growing for 17 days. When we graze 70% of the plant, 50% of the roots stop growing for 17 days. When we only graze 50% of the plants, no roots stop growing. So if we think about around here, we grow about 65% of our forage by middle of June. So that's kind of interesting when we talk about timing of rainfall. Um, yeah. So if you miss 17 days during that peak growing period, you missed a lot of opportunity to grow some forage. And then if we go into dormancy like this, super short then we have fewer solar panels out there to capture the sun's energy and to turn it into more okay, forage yeah. and then the roots it will start to scavenge carbohydrates from the roots these plants are less drought, drought tolerant and then we also have less roots to feed our microbiology in the soil which ultimately affects our above ground production so there's a lot going on just if you overgraze yes and then here's another important deal you know, poor ground cover, 10% ground cover, for example, you've grazed it so short, you can see a golf ball out there. 73% of your rain is going to run off. With good ground cover, 60 to 75% ground cover, only 2% of your rainfall runs off. Right. The rest soaks in. So all this ultimately will affect above ground production. So like the hay meadow when Cole Fagan came out and looked at it and he was doing the, the testing of this, the hay meadow was like the best he had 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 all of his tests he had been doing that was the best because I mean, there hadn't been animals on it in two years yep so uh i actually this is what he did is he took these infiltration rings he stuck these rings in the ground and then they timed how long it took for the water to soak in yeah. so that's the infiltration test that they did but then he went to the front of the property and it was there was a lot of runoff. Yes. That's a, 
that those pastures are what we call our sacrifice pastures. Yep. So that's where the, when we bring those herds up, they're going to spend more time there stomping on it, grazing, whatever's there. And it takes the most beating, you know, and that's where we drive our tractors to, to give hay. And so it takes a beating. And so those plants don't have time to grow up and stuff. And, and then you have your root system and all the good things happening for that water to flow. And, and like so we talked about, so like a, the multi-species cover crop, the turnip is going to have a tuber this long. They can be this long. And so the turnips and radish, part of the idea with the turnips and radishes is it will break up compaction. So it'll bust through that compacted layer. And then when that turnip rots, now you have pore space or air in there, the which will be healthy soil. Yeah. So your water can go down. Yep. Yeah. So that's why we do more than just plant rye. We'll plant rye. We'll plant legumes in there to fix atmospheric nitrogen. And then we'll also put some broad leaves in there, uh -huh. which there again, the three sisters, what is the three sisters? It's a grass, a broad leaf and a legume. Corn is a grass. The broad leaf is the squash and the legume is the beans. So yeah. this, this is technology that they've been utilizing oh, since really? the Lacandon Indians. Yeah. So 25% harvest efficiency, okay. adjustment factor for slope and distance to water. 100% on a big ranch, you know, you might have different utilization if they've got to walk five miles to get to water or yeah. something like that. So we'll just leave that there and we'll hit calculate stocking rate. Okay, so average production. I don't want to look at uh, Oh, <laughs> don't no. Don't be nervous. <laughs> no, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. Uh, so on a five year average from 2017 to 2022, the average production in pounds per acre is uh, 3,116 pounds per acre. That's great. And that's about what we do around here. Uh, you're, if we just isolated the Eastern Gamma grass area, I guarantee that would be much higher. Oh, yeah. You know, so this is an average, it's averaged everything together. The lowest of that five year window was 2,800 pounds roughly. The highest was about 3,700 pounds, okay. almost 3,800 pounds. So that's pretty amazing. So then it's, this is just the summary right here. So it's saying you can run 13 1,000 pound animals, 365 days of the year. On the best year within that five year period, it'd be 16. And then if we scroll down here, it shows the math. Um, there's a time series plot, but this is, yeah, this is the, here's, here's another summary here. It's talking about percent production of normal um, and then those varying stocking rates. So you can see 2017 um, was 16, 2021 was 14. I don't know what happened to 2022 there, um, but here's the math and they do, they do a pretty good job of that. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting. So what we've got here is we've got, um, so they took the average, so um, 3,116 pounds per acre. Um, oh, they, they put that in tons, times 189.2 acres. So we go 3116 times 189.2 equals that number, but they did it in tons. So we'll divide by 2,000, yeah. And so 294.77, they've got 295. Um, I'm going to put it back in pounds and then convert it. Now they do harvest efficiency. So how do they do that? There again, we've got 31, 116 times 189.2 is uh, 589, 589,547.2 pounds per acre. But you only get 25% of that. Mm -hmm. Take half of the half. half. So times 0.25 equals this number, but they've got it in tons again. So we've got to divide by 2000 equals 73.69 or 74 tons per acre. Um, and so then we've got a thousand pound animal unit utilizing 30 pounds per day. And if you go 30 pounds times 365 days, that's 10,950 or about 11,000 pounds per year. That one animal is consuming. One animal. Yeah. At so 3%. Yep. 3% of their body weight. Yep. So, you know, if you go, Hey, I need two months worth of hay. Well, then you can figure that out at 30 pounds per day per thousand pound animal unit. That's how much. You know what I mean? So if you had 20 animals times 30 pounds per day, um, and say you needed 60 days times 30 pounds, uh, you'd need 1800 pounds per one oh. times 10 animals, you know? And then you divide that by thousand pound bales. And this is how you can estimate how many bales you need that you'd need. So for 10 animals, you need 18 bales, mm -hmm. you know, for a month, roughly. Just a question from a non rancher just hangs out with them. <laughs> is there a variance on the type of animal 
or is it specifically weight? You well, know, these are, bison versus cattle versus sheep versus yeah. hogs versus. Well, so we make an adjustment. So a twelve hundred pound cow, we would adjust that by one point two. We have bulls that weigh eighteen hundred pounds. Yeah. Uh, sheep, for example, that would be a 0.2 animal unit. We call these animal units. So 1,000 pound is the base, and then we adjust up and down based on the size. Mm -hmm. So sheep and goats, 0.15 or 0.2. And then you can really go deep into it. A lactating cow is going to have higher nutritional demand than one that's dry. And so, you know, you can really go down the rabbit hole. This is just a quick way for you to kind of get a ballpark. Um, but there again, 3% of their body weight or 30 pounds per day for a 1,000 pound animal unit times 365 days, um, and there, there's our 10,950 right there. Uh, so they've made the adjustment, and that, that's the annual demand, and then that's how they get the stocking rate. And then they've also adjusted it here, and they said 14 acres per head, and we've talked about that before. And around here, honestly, the really good stuff might be 11, but really 15 is kind of our average, 14 to 15 is our average here. Now I've been to places in Abilene, Texas, in Taylor County, really kind of the best stuff is 20 acres uh, per animal unit, right? Mm -hmm. But then we have some places up in the Mesa, in the rockier soil, on the bigger ranches, up in the higher elevation, farther west, in that same county, that might be 100 plus, Jeez. 80 to 100 plus. Go out to New Mexico, let's go clip that. We could play with this and draw off some spot in New Mexico, it might be 200 plus acres per animal unit. Animal. I mean, think about it, uh, you know? Well, yeah, this is like a... Yeah, it's eye-opening. It definitely is eye-opening. And then also what we need to reiterate here for, for the people watching is this is, if you want to graze your animals 365 days, if you want them to you just live off the land mm -hmm. with your own management, this is this. This doesn't include supplemental feeding. This doesn't include hay. Right. If you want to basically not spend any money out of your pocket for feed, this is how many you would have to have to live off of the land. So look, now we can adjust. What if we only wanted them there for 30 days? So it's doing this on the fly. So say you had multiple places, you know, you got this place over here, that place over here. Mm -hmm. Hey, I just need to take these 60 animals over there for 30 days or, or how many animals could I have there for 30 days? So I adjusted this number here to 30 okay. and now we'll, oops, we'll go down here and we'll see if it made the adjustment for us. Uh, 164 for 30 days. So now you could have more animals. Because it's, 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 it's one acre per head, but you're only doing it for, for 30, days. 30 days. Yes. Yes. So you could, so you could essentially on this map here, you know, if we want to look at our, our property and let's say, let me go in here. Let's say on, you know, the hay meta, which is, I think 17 or 18 acres, you could measure this out and say, I just want to know how long can we put our herd with your, the certain number of animals on that specific pasture. Mm -hmm. So you, you can draw your map out or. Exactly. How many do I want on this front 80 right here? Yep, yep. And what I did was I downloaded these reports for the one that I did by pasture. I just drew off each individual pasture, downloaded the report, and then the report's pretty neat. We'll just download this for fun. Uh, it, it shoots this all out in a report that looks really nice. Okay. Uh, so I'd be curious, so, you know, technically we're feeding hay for how many months? Well, because of the situation we're in, yes, the drought, but... here, we're starting early, but I mean, we're October, not... November, December, January, February, March, even in April. And I would say, you know, and this is just, this is just my opinion. Let me find this report here. You know, I would plan for, for having two months of, you know, supplemental feeding around here. I know guys in Montana that can get by for uh, two months of hay, uh, so it is possible. And then, you know, if you're strictly concerned about economics, you know, you've got a lot of waste with the hay, it's degrading while it's in the bale, it costs a lot of money. So um, at the end of the day, you know, the economics on feeding hay are not good. So you ideally you wanna be stocked according to the capacity of the land. But hey, other people have other goals and, and that's fine, you know. Um, 
And so you can you can adjust that uh, based on what you have. Let me. So what other things could you do to increase your stocking rate? Well, at the end of the, well, at a certain point in time, the land can only produce so much. So for example, Bermuda grass will respond exponentially to nitrogen fertilizer, but still at a certain point, right? We can feed a guy 10,000 calories a day, shoot him up with steroids, and Brian Shaw still only weighs 450 pounds. He only can get to, he might, he might have got up to 460 at one point in time, but that's it. And most guys aren't Brian Shaw, right? Most guys, they get to like 350 steroids and 10,000 calories a day, just going for it. Mm -hmm. But there's a capacity, that's it. So at the end of the day, native grass doesn't really respond to fertilizer. So its capacity is such, we can improve the overall health of it, but at the end of the day, it, it, it kind of has a max production that it can produce and that's it. So at, at a certain point, it's like, you kind of got to get more land if you want to have more livestock. So that's just how it is. And even with pasture, uh, that's the steroids example, I guess, you know, you can pour the nitrogen and to the Bermuda, but still at a certain point in time, it's like maybe 10,000 pounds per acre with Bermuda, just feeding it nitrogen. And bison don't like Bermuda. Wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> they don't like Bermuda. They'll only eat it if they have to, or it's you know the little tender stuff like on a golf course. <laughs> I'll be done. It has to be low. Once it once it gets big and fluffy, you they know, don't like it. they do not like it. Interesting. So. so there's really no way to increase your not if you want to yield efficiently, and effectively, and, and and graze what you know what our land has given us. Yeah, they don't. You can't add to it. Now, I'm know, sure Ethan like can talk like about cover crops, cover crops, some of that stuff. So, yes. So that that is that is uh, one thing. You know, when we talk about our rainfall patterns, and we're getting more of this rain during the time that our we're we're warm season grass dominated. So they have different growth curves, but they there again we tend to grow the majority of our warm season forage, roughly sixty five percent of it by mid June. Um, and like for this year, for example, and I have the weather data here, um, we missed out on some, some key uh, months of growth as far as rainfall. We got, here, I'll just show you here real quick. We got a lot of rain during the dormant time when the, gra the warm season grasses weren't gonna grow more no matter how much it rained. So then we talk about cool season cover crops. I'm, I don't have enough data to, to support it, but my feeling is cool season cover crops will not work great over native grass. Cause if you think about it, if your native grass is healthy and you have six inches of stubble out there, there's all kinds of competition. So say we're planting a, a cool season cover crop mix that say 60% rye and 30% hairy vetch, red clover, white clover, alfalfa, you name it, uh, legumes, and then maybe 10 or 20% uh, turnips and radishes. Uh, grass broadleaf legume mix. We plant that right about now. Uh, people are using the no-till drill right now to do that. Um, we might get some grazing out of it before it goes dormant, and then we'll get some more spring grazing out of it. Bermuda grass really likes warm weather. Mm -hmm. Well, the native grass might kick off, let's say, first of April, maybe even as early as March. So now it's competing with your cool season cover crop. Whereas Bermuda is short, right? We can graze the Bermuda down to three inches. So there's no height issue with competition. And then the Bermuda comes on way later. So it works really well overseeding those cool season cover crops on Bermuda. Theoretically, the old world blue stems can be grazed a little bit shorter as well. Um, and, and we could try that, but they put down a thick mat and they're very competitive. So I'm not sure how that's gonna work. We had a couple people do it on native last year and they weren't real happy. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of competition out there. You know, on the, on the sacrifice pastures, yeah, 100%, you know, rehab them with that. That's what yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it about. will provide additional grazing. I mean, that's, that's one thing, that's one of the soil health principles. You know, if we, if we manage the cover and do all these things, but we don't incorporate the livestock, then we're not feeding the biology, you know, the way that we should be. So um, certainly on the, on the sacrifice pastures, yeah. And it may t might take three years of cover crop and to really get them to turn the corner, mm -hmm. you know? And, and then maybe you do that continuously on the sacrifice pastures like we talked about. Yeah. This one this year, that one that year, and just keep doing that. I so just, yeah. We just brush hogged, uh, yesterday I brush hogged pasture too, like not where the barn is, the one where you can see them on the road. I just brush hogged it, so. I know. Uh, yeah, so maybe that would be a good opportunity to go through some 
I left a six to eight inch stubble on it. Excellent. I really tried to keep. How'd that work out? Did the, was the shredder yeah, it could hanging up, in the air? Or it was go up like 10, 10 inches. And the wheel was touching mm -hmm. when you were doing it. Excellent. Yeah. Good. It worked Good. Out. It was a. He has got a big one. Yeah. Try tri fold or whatever. Um, but I got cis pasture, basically. Um, it's just twenty. Yeah. And we did we did all that yesterday. So. Well, and the ragweed seed should not be matured because ragweed pollen is peaking right now. Yeah. <laughs> Hence everybody's allergies. So yeah. uh, shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. And we did a burn the other day and I think we really got the ragweed good because it wasn't, the seeds weren't mature. So we burnt some ragweed, some sericea on that, whole bunch of trees and stuff. I can't wait for you to see that one. You'll be really yeah. excited about yeah. that one. But this is this is the rainfall. So I measure it out here and then we'll get reports in the county that are like inches different from one end of the county to the other. And this is the smallest county I've ever worked in. So it can be highly variable. But that, that gauge right out here. So I'm comparing. I look at the greatest 24 hour total, but that really is irrelevant if you're managing your cover properly. But I, I do the rainfall that I measured out here versus the, what the measure in that average is, which is just uh, east of town and then the percent of average. And you can see 100 and so I go October to October. This is 114% of average rainfall in October, 135 in November, 180 roughly in December. So January, we had 70% of normal rainfall, not a big deal. February, 226% of normal. Jeez. So, hey, it, maybe at the, the Ponderosa, you banked that soil moisture. You got it in February, you're going to use it in March. But if you were in the Arbuckle Mountains, it just trickled into the limestone, into the aquifer, and you didn't, you're not using that later. Mm -mm. So then, you know, 226% of normal in February, 151 in March, April and May, two of our peak growing months, 62% of normal, 59% of normal rainfall out here. So low. yeah, low, low. So overall we're above average rainfall for the year but timing matters. And then August, we're not growing a whole lot of forage in August, but we only had 6.5% of normal in August. Well, and just like you said, warm season, which is those natives in June, not, you know, it, I don't know about what that one, let's say it's 125%. But April and May were very, those are, those are arguably two of the most there's important no, months. There's no boost to really get things going. Yeah. Yeah. You could calculate it out. If you say we got 65% of our forage produced by June 15th, well then, Two of those months are a 40% reduction. So that matters. Yeah. And then because the satellites are going every 16 days with this wrap tool, we can actually look at current year production. Production as of September 13th is 2,287 pounds per acre. So down some. The long term average is 2,574. Um, and then it has this graph here. Um, I have not delved into this whole 16 day uh, measurement stuff. Uh, I think the stocking rate thing is really handy for people. Like I said, if you're going to buy a new place or, or you're just wanting to get it in the ballpark, it's a, it's a moving target, but you got to get on the paper first, you know, and a lot of people aren't even on the paper. They're like winging shots over here and it's hitting the berm kind of deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's just, you know, like I, like I've said, when you grow up around here and I, you don't really know these things until you have animals and you have your own land. But growing up around here, the whole, you know, acres was four or five acres per head. You know, that's just the old farmer idea. Oh, we, you know, here in Southern Oklahoma, we've got that four or five acres a head. And then when you really dive into it, it's like, oh no, yeah. you're times two. Yeah, and we could do the math at 10,000 pounds per acre production, which would be like arguably some of the maximum production potential for Bermuda. And it's still not that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's all, you have all these resources. Now, if you really want to take care of your land and do the right things, because you can sit here and look at all this and you're, you're looking at your stocking rate because that affects all these things, you know, like your soil health. And then here, you know, what we do with part of Lawa is the watershed the what you know water you're putting back into the ground how much is getting there how far is it going and you know so it's it's a holistic approach and then you go to the burn unit and you're looking at you know birds and the insects and we did all that in the spring you know it's uh it's a lot but you know you grow up here in that four or five acres and so i'm sure there's lots of 
farmers that still have that mindset. And I'm not taking anything away from the farmers or ranchers, but we just, we're, we're young and trying to learn all of this and want to want to do the right thing. Put a four by four enclosure up. If you have yeah. Bermuda and you want to know if you're producing 6,000 pounds or 10,000 pounds, put an enclosure up. Yeah. At the end of the growing season, we'll clip it. Or you can clip it throughout the growing season. I recommend waiting till after dormancy. Clip it, it's just gonna be a picture of that year, but then multiple years, and you can compare it with the wrap data. We should have done that at the hay meta. Yep, so just, just I recommend a four by four, that way your hoop fits in there and they can't get in there and get it. Like I said, you can use a yard stick, you can, uh, you can a PVC four four frame. You yeah, can, you four by four, frame. four T-posts, yep. And so in this guide that I'm, I'm gonna give you here, it has a picture of one in there, yeah. talks okay. about exclosures. So these, we set up a couple of these in the, uh, in the burn unit. Yes, yep, for the grid. This all still looks the same right now, but you know, and like you said, a couple of years or something, you can see the, the change, but you can see all this is grazed around and this is what it could look like you know, after so long. Yeah, because the animals utilized it, but then that tells you how much you produced. And then the one behind there just kind of goes over how to do the inventory. Yeah, and NRCS will help you do this. This is the technical assistance we provide free to everybody. Come out into the field. That's what these guys are for. Now, there's, people don't understand that is the NRCS and people like Ethan are here for people like Marissa and I that are the farmers and ranchers. And so, there's so many resources. It's just reaching out and starting that relationship, you know, and uh, it, it, it's been great for us. And we've, you know, we've done a lot of stuff. It's a wealth of knowledge, too. It's yeah, that's so much stuff. That to, yeah, I went yeah, to college. and got a wildlife degree, you know, I taught for 10 years and I really hadn't had to use the ecological and man animal management approach to it until you have your own animals in your own land and you're like and then you, you talk to him you talk to you and you're like oh it's not four or five acres it's you know 14 you know per head so it's like opening all this is opening but it's all free and we keep learning that's the thing yeah at one point in time we planted when i was a kid we planted russian olive in michigan along the creeks that was our best solution at the time. Now we're trying to kill Russian olive because we don't want it to take over and <laughs> be invasive. Know, well, it was the best knowledge we had at yeah. the time. And, and we were buying it from the Soil and Water Conservation District, the trees. Because at that time, we planted weeping lovegrass here in Murray County. Because yeah. at the time, it was the best solution that we had for erosion control. You got to continue to learn because the science evolves as we're seeing with the RAP tool and our knowledge involves, evolves. The more data that we get. Um, so if like, for me, I grew up around here, you know, showing animals and stuff. So the extension office has always been here. And so I didn't know the whole NRCS side until I started working with the animals at the park service and I went to Oklahoma State and you kind of learn those things. But if you were going to tell a farmer or rancher, maybe not in Oklahoma, maybe in Texas or Montana, if they needed some help, what, what, best knowledge would you tell them to like start these sort of free relationships? So we call it a service center and typically we're co-located like here we're co-located with the extension office and then the Murray County Soil and Water Conservation District. That's always a classic relationship. Um, a lot of times we'll also be co-located with FSA and most farmers and ranchers go into FSA office. So you might not have heard which of NRCS. Loan, which is a loan side. Uh, indemnity programs. programs, crop insurance, things like that. So they have a ton of programs. So like, for example, when I was in Abilene, Texas, I, we were on the fourth floor of the first financial bank building and I could see him getting off the elevator and going to FSA. And so I was like, oh, there's that guy I need to catch mm -hmm. and, and talk to you about something. So they're always in FSA, but we call it a service center because the idea is that it's a one stop shop. And then here you might come see me and I might get you in contact with Cole talking about Oaks and Prairie's joint venture. Mm -hmm. I might get you in co contact with Leah Lowe talking about um, Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Mm -hmm. I might get you in contact with Brian Fuller from Fish and Wildlife Service, who also has a program to support prescribed fire. Yeah. So like, I just consider us the hub. Like for example, Cole has nine counties he has to cover. I'm here Monday through Friday, eight to 4.30. Yeah. So, so come find me and I will point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And it all starts with the plan. So you and I developed a plan and you then- You came out, you looked. Yep. And I said, this is what we need help with. This is what we're trying to do. Yep. And at that time it was like, well, Cole's 
Cole's ready to go. Here's a yeah. here's an option right here, and and you selected that option. Mm -hmm. There's several other options moving forward. Uh, we did a prescribed fire with a gentleman the other day, and it was using uh, NRCS uh, assistance. And then the follow-up burn that he's going to do in a couple years, he'll probably use Fish and Wildlife Program. Mm, yeah. uh, but he was unaware of that, and so you know we just. And that's what Lake of the Arbuckles watershed is serving as right now. Yes. And a lot of these watershed groups nationwide, when I was in Montana, it was the Muscle Shell Watershed Coalition. We serve as the hub to bring all the partners together so we can all stay in communication and all work together collaboratively. Yes. So, for example, again, yesterday the prescribed fire was supposed to happen. It was an equip contract with NRCS. I couldn't be there. Well, Cole went out and took care of it for me. Yeah. You know, and then there was Lawa people out there, and then there was Arbuckle Rangeland Restoration Association people out there. There was 10 people out there. They had an incredible burn. The conditions were right. We needed to do it mm -hmm. when it, but I couldn't, I wasn't available because we were having a quality yeah. assurance review. They've got all these, all these people that are part of it that can help. Yep. Yeah. So one cool thing here, uh, under partner tools right here, if you were to click partner tools, I already got it pulled up. So there's several, there's a variety of things you can do here. Again, lots of data, lots of power to analyze data here. We just scratch the surface. But if you click partner tools right here, and uh, I'm just gonna click it just to show you some of the partner tools. So these are partner agencies in conjunction with USDA, developing tools using that satellite data and that remote sensing data uh, to do some things. For example, tracking cheat, cheat grass after wildfires, tracking wildfires, but I've already got it pulled up. This is kind of neat here. So this is the, the Landscape Explorer. So basically they've taken a whole bunch of aerial imagery back to 1950s-ish. Uh, I'm sure it's a composite. And so you can scroll this over your land. Let's make sure we're looking at your place. Uh, Rocky Point cabins. Yours was labeled on here a minute yeah, ago. Labeled. Yeah, it should be. Cross Timbers was labeled on there. Uh, let's do this. There we there go. Is. All right, so there's Cross Timbers Bison Ranch. And if we pull this across, we can look at what the landscape looked like 70 years ago, roughly in 1950s. And so certainly like when we talk about ponderosa pine and woody encroachment like out west it would be really drastic but you can see how wide the buffers may have been on a creek or where the woody encroachment so for example right here see how much more of a buffer there was along the creek um we were looking at another gentleman's place earlier today and and like for example there's there's no trees here right now there were trees there before so it's kind of fun you know you can play with it, yeah, but you can grow up here on this. That's not me. That's not my property, but, but you can look at the yeah woody encroachment. Made. Yeah. And most of that's cedar. Yep. And you can do this all over the United States. It's kind of fun. So say you want to look at a, another property. See, there wasn't even a pond or a flood prevention site there before. It's what kind of fun. This, Ethan, do you know what that dark stuff is? This, uh, I do not know what that is. We might be able to zoom in. I don't know. Um, so this is um, old aerial photos, and I'm not sure, maybe it was flooded at one point in time. That's very possible that that was flooding, maybe. That's a high hit. Well, part of it, this is a high point and that's a low point. I wonder what those are. Cause see, you can see the trees. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't messed with this a whole bunch, but it's, mm. it's kind of fun. That is neat. Yeah, so you can do that for the whole United States. I mean, you scroll out to the whole United States and look at that kind of stuff. That's pretty neat. Yep. What's happened to the open space near your house since the 1950s? OSU on their Instagram, their Rangeland, I think it's Rangeland app or their Instagram uh, profile, whatever. Yes. They put a lot of those images just of, of these. Woody encroachment. Yes. So that comes from the wrap tool. And that's actually. So that's what they're pulling it from. Yep. And so let's see, launch wrap. So on this one, we can look at, this is the, I, I hit launch wrap. We can look at annual forb and grass cover, perennial forb and grass cover, shrub, tree, bare ground, total biomass from those different uh, categories here, herbaceous, trees and shrubs, uh, or excuse me, annuals versus perennials. So that's the, this is what the cheat grass map, for example, is looking at. They've basically looked at annuals. Uh, you can look at tree encroachment, for example. 
Uh, so we click on that. And then you can pick your year right here. And so you could compare years. So you could zoom into different areas and compare uh, tree cover for those different years. And it's a gradation, see, 100% would be the darker. And so if we clicked a different year, so there's Michigan where I'm originally from. Um, and I think you would have to zoom in to yeah, really to get some, your, yeah. some gradation there because we're so far zoomed out. But, and you could look at shrub cover. This would be like Ponderosa pine encroachment in Montana for sure. Uh, you could look at tree cover densities and how they've changed over time. Um, That's pretty neat. Yeah. So it's just all old satellite images. Yep. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yep. Actually. Pretty neat. You know something, speaking of this, my Kevin's dad, my, my grandpa, Eldon, they have some land in the mountains, in the Rocco Mountains. They said that when they first, he worked uh, for the state building flood controls. And um, when they first get started looking at that property, I guess they were working around there, those hills had no trees on them. No, they'd be like, meet me at the one cedar tree. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, when you drive to the Arbuckle Mountains now, of course, I-35 runs right to the middle. Of them. It's, I mean, we all know it's just yeah. cedar. There's no room for anything. Yeah, you, you could look at you there. could look at that comparison with that. This. I think I was just yeah. thinking of the Arbuckle Mountains, just him in the 70s. You know, those old men saw what those, the mountains were just completely what they should look like wide open and you can see those old burns on i-35 where those fires went through and there's hardly any cedar and now you've got you know it's just open grassland or you've got some looks like cottonwoods or something is starting yeah. to shoot up out there yeah there's a bunch of cottonwoods coming you know out, that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. neat to see that and those were accidental burns or whatever yeah so, our oaks and our cross timbers are too thick and too numerous yeah you know it used to be a savanna where there were scattered oaks We've been to places recently in the last week where you can't even walk through. The oaks are too thick. There's no herbaceous understory, you know. So actually the burn that we did the other day was that same situation. The oaks were too thick. He remembers when his dad shredded 80 acres on the north half. Well, now it's mature oaks. Yeah. You know, so, you know, winged elm, bodark or osage orange, oh. uh, oaks, persimmon. Mm -hmm. uh, even hackberry and some of the other wildlife preferred trees. But persimmons really... You know, they'll, they'll go wild around here. So you have to burn to control the persimmons. Yeah. And then, you know, when we're talking about our prescribed fire, you know, the deciduous trees like persimmon, you know, if the leaves are off of them and we're burning during dormancy, we're not really killing as many of those. So if we do a burn like we did the other day, the leaves are on those, we're getting those. That fall burn or that late growing season burn will lend itself to probably more weedy plants or forbs mm -hmm. because they have bare ground over the winter time whereas like people in kansas and nebraska they tend to burn in the spring because they want they want to prefer the, the give preference to the grass mm -hmm. so 30 to 60 days later with rainfall after the burn theoretically the grass has grown up to 10 12 inches they can graze it down to six yep. it's highly palatable very nutritious but in that situation yes you'll get the cedars um there again Plants are like bears. They need to go yeah. into dormancy in the best shape of their life. So a dormant season burn, yes, it will kill some cedars, probably not as many of the persimmons and things like that. But when we do these fall, late growing season burns, we're sending those plants into dormancy in the worst shape of their life. So we really get a good kill on woody, woody plants. Mm -hmm. So each one you're giving up something to gain something. There's you know, a reason they both why have their value in the fall. And there's a reason why you burn in the spring. Yep. And there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an approach to that. Yep. Yeah. And so we burnt in October. Yes. Of last year, even in the, like a hard drought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and people were like, what are you doing? But the reason of that was the woody encroachment, which is here and the blackberries, you yep. know, really trying to, and clean up the place, you know, essentially to try to eradicate some of those woody plants. Um, so we burnt in October to do that. So if we wanted to maybe bring back and try to clean up for native grasses, we could do that in the spring. Yep. A good follow up burn is a spring burn. A lot of times we have to, mechanically clear brush before we can do yeah, a burn true. and then in my opinion i think it's really good to do one of those late growing season burns because after we mechanically clear, clear brush now nature abhors a vacuum all this other stuff starts popping up mm -hmm. persimmon because we have all that bare ground boom do a fall burn and then four years later or two years or three years uh our return of those about four years here do a spring burn then yeah. 
You know what I mean? Change the season up. Change it up. Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, you can see our, our Keach Byram drought index yeah. is incredibly high still. Yeah. So look at this, Cole. Show this. So so yeah, Ethan can explain this. This is our KBDI, but this is shows the drought index. We are right here. And it shifted a little looks like it shifted some, but it, it was when you first sent this out to me a couple weeks ago, it was just like right here. Yep. The yep. hardcore of it. But so obviously the the more the color, the pinks and the red is eight hundred is, is is the highest. That means it's extremely dry. There is no soil moisture essentially. Yeah. Uh, to put it in a nutshell. So that's Murray County. Yep. Right there. And we Show typically you. don't burn this this will explain it right here it talks about not not applying any uh fire above 700 last year we waited for it to get below 600 you know mm -hmm. the the drier the soil is the longer it will take for those plants to recover um yesterday we wanted to have a pretty uh intense fire so we burned with a kbdi that was we were actually over into garvin county so we were still closer to the 600 which mm. makes me happy but the fire we are in a fuels and fire behavior um uh warning right now all the way into texas because the drier it gets the longer those flame lengths are the harder it is to control we burnt yours at 580 kbdi last year and like you saw it crept through the organic matter and caught that giant tree mm -hmm. on fire yeah, but if kbdi would have been like 200 that might not have happened yeah too much more. Yeah. yeah so sometimes you know we're balancing all those things yeah what's crazy i've got a buddy that lives used to live right there on texoma and it would typically be red we're flip-flop <laughs> this year they're very yeah. wet and we're very dry and usually it's the opposite so you know, the only thing that never changes is everything changes. So we're seeing some some different uh, weather patterns. Yeah, certainly. we are for sure. Um, yeah, no, I uh, just thank thank you for your help and stuff. And I mean, for us, for for Marissa and I, it's just uh, you know taking a leap into into here um, and meeting you and and Cole and you know bringing all those people together you know, to, to work together. And because we're all here, you, know, you guys are here for us basically. And that's just from us walking in here and talking to you. Hey, I, I, we, I really want to do the right thing. We want to change, change this property. We need to get rid of cedar. You want to do all these things for our bison. And that's just picking up the phone and making that call. You coming out and looking, and then it all begins from there. And so, you know, we, about year two now, I guess we've been doing this, but, um, I, uh, it's just an easy approach to do this, and, and, and it's here. The USDA is for us, the NRCS is for us, and the FSA is for us. So. Oh, could extension. Yeah. All of our partner agencies. At the end of the day, I do not have all the answers. Um, I don't claim to have all the answers. I continue to learn. I'm passionate about learning. I love helping people, but it's when we all come together. It's like the old cafes of old. When they yeah. get, you used to get together at the cafes, man, they came up with inventions, all kinds of stuff and they enjoyed each other's company. Yeah. And so I really like when all of us get together because I learn things from you, I learn things from Cole, I learn things from everybody and, and we're better when we're working together. So there's really a lot of power in working together there. There is, and it's not just, this is just, this is Oklahoma, it's just a little slice. Oh, this is Murray County. It is a very small slice of the whole picture of how many resources are out there. If you are wanting to get some help, and learn more about all these things. Now, I know this is technical and some of us may not be very computer savvy. That's okay. That's why you've got all these other tools to go out in your field and do the old fashioned clippings. Yep. Um, there's, there's ways we to, have guides. We can show yeah. you how to do it. We can do it for you or teach you how to do it, provide you with guides, a lot of options out there. Yeah. And we'll still do this. We're, we're going to do this eventually, um, with Ethan or without Ethan, he, Ethan, he's taught us this. So that's something that you can do is go out and clip. And so there's different ways and so much help that you can get to try to restore your land. If you want to convert it into native pasture, if it's for sheep, goats, um, cattle and bison in our case um, we want to make the ponderosa an awesome place and we want native grass you know that god gave us and that we have all this right here it's here yeah. you just have to manage it and take care of it and then we want to have good forage for our bison you know good soil health and good um, water so there's so many resources out there for people all you gotta do is just reach out so you can look up 
the USDA, you can look up the NRCS, you can find all those service centers online. So whatever state or city you live in, you can look it up right now. If you got the internet, you can look it up and find it. And then you gotta just pick up the phone, call a number, that's the easiest thing. Call that office and it'll start from there. And that's basically what I did. And um, now that I've, we've dove into this, we've learned so that there's so many more resources out there than we thought. Yep. You know, so, um, I mean, what would you tell people to encourage them to? Yeah, just start with stopping in your NRCS office, uh, get involved. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll steer you in the right direction. You know, I still go back to Abilene and, and talk to some of the producers there. I still talk to producers in Montana where I was at for a little while. So, you know, maintaining those relationships, you know, is great. And, and just like this wrap tool, it was developed in conjunction with New Mexico State University and Montana State University. And so all those extension programs, they don't, they don't ex exist in a bubble either. They all communicate with each other and help build tools like this. So it's the collaboration that's really beautiful. But yeah, it starts by just finding your local NRCS office and, and start there. And Ethan always has an excuse to come to property because he's kind of a fan of Big Joe. So. Yes, big time. <laughs> yes, I have a man crush on Big Joe. So yes. <laughs> he's a good one to look at. So <laughs> now I want to thank you uh, for for taking the time for us and I hope um, there's this can be beneficial to uh, some of our followers and um, just we want to show this is our experience of what we've done and how it's gone and the relationships we have now um, so we hope that can pass on to you and if you have any questions you can always ask us um, leave a comment below and um, or you can email us and even if it's if you're in Murray County or around here Ethan would probably point you in the right direction of where to go. So, um, but anyways, thank you for all your help. Um, we still got a lot of work to do and a lot of, a lot of stuff to learn. So thank you guys for watching us. See you guys soon.